Welcome back to I am Medical. When a patient presents you with thrombocytopenia, if you're thinking ITP, TTP, HUS, DIC, those are great, but those are old. Are you thinking about the newer differential diagnosis that you might need to consider? You might want to hear what I got to say in this video. So let's begin. A 40-year-old male presents to the ER with complaints of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain and chills and also complains of having decreased urine output over the past couple of days. He says that a doctor just started him on a new medicine approximately 5 days ago. On physical exam, patient's vitals are stable, his blood pressure is 130 over 80, his heart rate is 85. His respiratory rate is 20 and his temperature is 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Cardiovascular exam S1, S2 heard, no robs, gallops or murmurs. Lung exam, normal vesicular breath sounds, no crackles or wheezing heard. Abdominal exam, soft, non-tender, no organ or megaly and bowel sounds are heard in all four quadrants. Neurologic exam is completely normal. So far from a patient's history and physical exam, everything seems super vague. Patient is basically coming with some vague abdominal symptoms, he's feeling weak and he's got decreased urine output. Physical exam essentially is normal. Sometimes that's how your patient is going to be presenting. They will have vague complaints when they present and your physical exam is quite unrevealing. Obviously, we have to get some labs to see if there's something wrong with this guy. We get a CBC. Patient's platelet count in the CBC is 100,000. Hemoglobin is 8. WBC is 9 and normal. When you get chemistry, we see a sodium of 135, potassium is 5.3, BUN of 70 and a creatinine of 5. Wow, that's pretty high. LFTs are normal and his coagulation panel including his PTT, PT and INR are completely normal. So from this patient's labs, what do we have? We are seeing that this patient's got thrombocytopenia. His platelet count is 100,000. And we also see this guy is anemic, his hemoglobin is 8, his WBC is essentially normal. On chemistry, what we have here is an acute kidney injury, an acute kidney injury that is pretty bad. His creatinine is actually 5, his BUN is 70, it's pretty high. So from here, what do we have? We have thrombocytopenia, we have anemia and we got renal failure. When you think about this triad of symptoms, what is your mind immediately going to? Are you thinking HUS? Absolutely right, hemolytic uremic syndrome is an important differential diagnosis to consider in this patient. But wait a second, isn't HUS happening in children? Normally we speak about a child who gets the bacterial infection involving your gut and we call this enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157H7 which releases a shiga like toxin and causes hemolytic uremic syndrome. But this is not a child, this is an older person. And can an older person get a picture like HUS? Yes, it is possible, you can get it, yes. But what else should we be considering in this patient? Could it be atypical HUS where you have an overactive complement cascade that is presenting like hemolytic uremic syndrome? Yes, we should consider that differential diagnosis too. But another important differential diagnosis that probably never pops into anybody's head is called DITMA. What is DITMA? It is drug induced thrombotic microangiopathy. There you go. I'm sure you've never heard of this before, but is it an important differential diagnosis to consider? Absolutely. So let's dive in to DITMA. So what is thrombotic microangiopathy? It is essentially the formation of thrombuses in small micro vessels in your body and as a result causing problems. So when it comes to drug induced thrombotic microangiopathy, it is drug induced. That's the important thing. You're giving a patient a drug and the drug is causing the problem. Now the drug can cause the problem in two important methods. It could be immune mediated or non-immune mediated. When we say immune mediated, your body has pre-existing antibodies roaming around in your blood. So when you expose a patient to this drug, what would happen is these autoantibodies goes and tries to attack the drug but also cross reacts and goes and attacks your endothelial cells as well as your platelets. So essentially what would happen is you will cause endothelial damage. Whenever you cause an endothelial damage, the normal physiologic process is going to happen and that is formation of a thrombus. You will form a thrombus within these small vessels. Once you form a thrombus, what's going to happen? Are you going to use up your platelets? Yes, it's called consumptive thrombocytopenia. So you will end up with thrombocytopenia because you're forming a lot of small platelet plugs within these vessels and as a result using up your platelets. Simple, right? Very good. And next what happens is an, an RBC comes and tries to swing through this narrow vessel because there's a thrombus there. And as a result, what's going to happen? Are you thinking the RBC is going to get its head shaved off? Absolutely. And what would it come out on the other side looking like? It would look like a helmet, which is 
is called a schistocyte and this is called microangiopathic hemolytic anemia so microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with schistocytes plus presence of thrombocytopenia are the two hallmark features that must be present even when you consider DITMA. So drug-induced thrombotic microangiopathy must have schistocytes with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. So DITMA can happen because of two important mechanisms. One is immune mediated, the other is non-immune mediated. Immune mediated is when your body already has pre-existing antibodies that will cross react with the drug you're giving but also go and cause cross reaction and damage your endothelial cells whereas non-immune is when you give a drug and the drug by itself causes direct toxicity to the endothelial cells and as a result end of the day what is it going to do when you damage endothelial cells you will form a clot when you form a clot what's going to happen you're going to use up your platelets and cause thrombocytopenia and when you form a thrombus and an RBC tries to swim through, you'll end up with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with schistocytes. So that is immune and non-immune DITMA, how it actually happens. Yeah. Okay, great. But doesn't this seem very familiar to TTP? Yes, it does. So should TTP also concurrently be in your differential diagnosis? Absolutely, because TTP is life-threatening and can kill somebody. And therefore, TTP should be a dreaded differential diagnosis that you should be thinking about even in this patient. So what makes DITMA unique and different from TTP? Well, for one, when you look at your plated count, in this patient was only 100,000. Now, when you look at a patient with TTP, you will see that their plated count is much low. It will be less than 30,000. That's why when you look at your plasmic score, your plated count has to be less than 30,000. But in a patient with DITMA, your plated count can actually be much higher. It could be even 100,000. There will be a significant drop. Say if your plated count is normally running in the range of 400, you could have a drop of about 300 points and get to 100 or maybe to 200. But your plated count can also be normal. But the idea is you're acutely having thrombocytopenia from a normal level. So when somebody is exposed, like this patient actually got a drug which was given by his doctor about five to seven days ago. And that drug is what's called causing the problem. So normally a patient who's presenting with DITMA, depending if it's immune versus non-immune, when it is immune mediated, they will know it will happen really quickly. The moment you get the drug, the presentation is going to be very acute. The moment they take the drug, immune mediated reaction is going to happen and within a day to two days, you will present with symptoms. When it's non-immune, this patient can be on this drug for weeks to months. It's a cumulative damage that's happening to the vessel. So they could be presenting with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, slow renal failure, slow thrombocytopenia, all of this happening over a period of weeks to months. So that's the key difference when it comes to immune versus non-immune. Immune comes quickly, non-immune takes its time. Nevertheless, even if it's immune or non-immune, eventually when the patient comes to the hospital and you suspect your differential diagnosis and you get the labs, that's where the game begins. When you look at the presence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia, now your brain should be starting to go into this differential diagnosis. Okay, so the thrombocytopenia will not be so severe in patients with DITMA. That's important. Remember when we talk about TTP, speak about classic pentad with end organ damage such as renal problems. Patient will have GI, will have neurologic as well as cardiac symptoms. But when it comes to a patient with DITMA, yes, again, because it's a microangiopathy, it can affect any of the organs that you speak about. Because it's a microangiopathy, any vessel you block off because of this process and you have a decreased blood supply to this organ, you'll have a problem. If you have a problem, can you have renal failure? Yes. Could you have GI problem? Yes. Could you have neurologic problem? Yes. But one important thing we spoke about when we spoke about TTP, remember your renal failure will not be bad with TTP. Your creatinine normally will be below two. It does not get bad with TTP. But with DITMA, your renal function can be really bad. Your DITMA can take out your kidney in a heartbeat. And see, this patient's creatinine was five. Your patient's kidney can shut down so bad that it can actually end up with renal failure. The other condition you should probably think about when the patient comes with bad renal failure with a similar presentation is going to be your HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which happens in children. So obviously, since we have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, any of these patients, you should always get some more labs to prove your diagnosis. So number one, we should get a smear. You get a smear, what are you looking for? You're looking for schistocytes. Apart from that, you need to get some labs. What labs are we going to get? 
hemolytic labs and that is going to be a reticulocyte count now your reticulocyte count is going to be high because this is hemolysis that's happening in the vessel your bone marrow is fine if your bone marrow is fine your bone marrow is going to be producing a lot of premature rbcs which we call reticulocytes as well as polychromasia is going to be present Number two, anytime you destroy an RBC, what's going to go up? LDH, lactate dehydrogenase goes up no matter what cell you kill. So if you kill an RBC, you're going to have elevated LDH. Next, would you have elevated bilirubin? Yes, you can have elevated bilirubin. Now remember, elevated bilirubin is more common when the patient actually has extravascular hemolysis with macrophages actually engulfing this hemoglobin and converting your heme to bilirubin. But normally when you have intravascular hemolysis, that's not what really happens. You break down your RBCs, you release the hemoglobin and the heme pigment actually is eliminated in the urine, giving your urine that red color and a positive dipstick on blood, but you will not see RBCs. But truly will you have elevated bilirubin? Not really, but can you have some? Yes, because there's still macrophages roaming around in your blood and macrophages can engulf this hemoglobin and convert it to bilirubin. So you could expect some elevated unconjugated bilirubin in these patients. Number three, haptoglobin. Haptoglobin will be low. Whenever you have a patient with intravascular hemolysis, haptoglobin goes and binds to this hemoglobin and therefore the free measurement of haptoglobin will be low. Anytime you suspect a patient of having some form of intravascular or extravascular hemolysis, you always need to get a Coombs test. And a Coombs test in this patient will be negative because it's not an autoantibody mediated destruction of RBCs. It is destruction of endothelial cells and formation of thrombus within the vessel and your RBCs are essentially getting killed because it's going through a narrow orifice and as a result gets its head cut off and that's why you end up with cystiosis. That's not autoimmune destruction of RBCs, that is just RBCs head getting chopped off because it's not watching where it's going. So those are the key labs you're going to get when a patient has got microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Next, your coagulation panel in these patients will be stone cold normal because there's no problem that's actually affecting your liver. Your PTT, PT, INR has to all be normal. Because this condition closely resembles HUS and if a patient presents with diarrhea and you're suspecting the patient's got bloody diarrhea, then you can actually test their stool to see if they might have enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Are you thinking about the right serotype? 0157H7. That is the serotype that actually produces Shigella-like toxin. But can Shigella do it by itself? Yes, Shigella was the godfather who produces Shigella-like toxin, not enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So Shigella can also cause HUS. And therefore, if somebody's got diarrhea, you need to test their stool to see if they might have this infectious organisms that is probably causing HUS. Okay, now, Despite all of this, we still cannot rule out TTP, right? Because TTP can have these exact two features. Just because you have worsening renal failure here doesn't mean you can rule out TTP. So when you think about TTP in all these patients, I think it is important for us to still get labs to make sure the patient does not have TTP. So what are you going to check for? You're going to check for Adam's TS13 level activity as well as inhibitor level. And in order for you to get a diagnosis of TTP, remember Adam TS13 activity needs to be less than 10%. And sometimes between 10 to 20%, we will still consider that diagnosis as long as your clinical picture fits. But if you really want to rule out an Adam's TS13 problem, your lab test needs to show that you have an activity level greater than 20%. Normal activity 60%, but you need to have greater than 20% to rule out TTP in this patient. So anybody you're suspecting DITMA, it is important for you to get Adams TS13 and prove that this patient does not have an Adams problem. So that gives us a very good understanding of the presentation of DITMA, how you diagnose it, when to think about it, and what really is going on in these vessels to cause the problem. Great, we've understood it perfectly well. Now the big question is this. I said there's an immune mediated group of drugs that can cause DITMA and a non-immune mediated group of drugs that can cause DITMA. So what are these drugs? Are there drug names that we need to be knowing? Yes, there is some drug names we need to be knowing. Now remember, there's a lot of drugs that can actually do this. But to remember, just a few drugs that I want you to know is in the immune mediated group, you have drugs like quinine, ciprofloxacin, penicillin, metronidazole, you have famcyclovir, mefloquine, rifampin, TMP, SMX. You also have chemotherapeutic agents such as gemcitabine, oxaliplatin, as well as antipsychotic seroquel. 
all of these drugs have been shown in case reports that they have caused immune mediated DITMA. Now we don't have full blown clinical trials to prove this. These are mostly based off of case reports and therefore it is important if your patient was started on these drugs to think about DITMA when they present in this manner. When it comes to non-immune drugs, the non-immune drugs that you should be looking for are mitomycin, vincristin, pentostatin, proteasome inhibitors that we typically use in patients with multiple myeloma such as bordizomib, carfilzomib, ixazomib. Then you got vascular endothelial growth factor monoclonal antibodies that we use for lung cancer such as bevacizumab. You also have vascular endothelial growth factor TKI such as sunitinib. You have BCR able TKI that we use for CML such as ponatinib. Calcineurin inhibitors such as cyclosporin, tacrolimus, serolimus. Then of course we have drugs of abuse such as oxymorphone ecstasy and cocaine and all of these drugs cause DITMA by a non-immune mechanism meaning by direct toxicity to the endothelial cells and remember non-immune would present slower over weeks to months whereas immune mediated drugs would happen very fast very quickly the moment the drug is actually exposed. So these are the two groups of drugs that you need to remember when you're suspecting DITMA. So when a patient presents you need to go back and dig into the chart and look to see if this patient was exposed to either groups of drugs to make that diagnosis. Well that's great now we figured out an important differential diagnosis that we would have never thought about if you didn't watch this video beforehand. And that's the point of this video. The point of the video is to make you think about things that nobody else thinks about so you can offer best patient care for your patient and make those important diagnoses when nobody else can. Stand out from the crowd. That's the purpose. So what are we going to do when it comes to treatment? Well, number one, like I said, when your patient presents this way, you need to make sure the patient does not have TTP because if it is TTP, the patient is going to require therapeutic plasma exchange. Whereas here, you do not do that. You do not do therapeutic plasma exchange. So make sure your Adams factor TS13 levels are normal. So what is the treatment for DITMA? Well, the treatment is purely supportive. You're going to stop the drug, number one. Number two, hydration. Hydrate your patients because the patient most likely has really bad kidney failure. So give them good amount of hydration to improve your renal function. And if the patient's renal function actually worsens to such an extent that it's now causing significant hyperkalemia or severe acidosis, then start your patient on dialysis. But essentially what it revolves around is truly supportive care. Treat the problems that's happening. If the patient becomes really thrombocytopenic that requires blood transfusion, then give them blood transfusion. If the patient has got significant anemia requiring blood transfusion, then give them blood transfusion. Bottom line is there's no specific treatment for DITMA. Stop the drug provide supportive care. Now, are there some experimental therapies which are pretty cool and we should know about? Yes, there are. What are they? Well, we have a drug that actually works on complement inhibition. Classically, this drug was used for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and atypical HUS because they have overactivation of their complement cascade. Do you know what drug this is? Are you thinking of eculizumab? Absolutely right on the money. Eculizumab is a C5 blocker and blocks off your complement cascade. By blocking off your complement cascade, you prevent the formation of membrane attack complex because remember when I speak about immune mediated destruction of your endothelial cells, moment the drug is exposed, you will activate certain parts of your complement cascade and complement activation will lead to membrane attack complex and that also does play a big role in destruction of endothelial cells. Not completely but to a certain extent it does so therefore you blocking your complement cascade by using eculizumab could benefit in patients so there are case reports where patients were treated with eculizumab and did have some success and eculizumab could be used for both immune mediated and non-immune mediated because we don't know the pathophys exactly for non-immune mediated nevertheless if there is a destruction going on if you block your complement cascade it could have some benefit so eculizumab could be used if your patient is absolutely not improving despite you doing all the supportive care at this point the patient is worsening and worsening and worsening your platelet counts are going down your renal failure is just not improving it might as well be time to try something different and eculizumab becomes one of the drugs that we can trial out again we don't have full-blown data on this to back this up so these are considered experimental therapies and therefore we can try them the next treatment we could potentially try as an experimental therapy is going to be n N-acetylcysteine, NAC therapy. NAC therapy is classically used for patients with Tylenol toxicity. N-acetylcysteine is used to replenish your glucose.
glutathione stores and basically suck up all the free radicals that is causing damage because of Tylenol toxicity. N-acetylcysteine has been shown to suck out some of the von Willebrand factor multimers because if you think of a patient with thrombotic microangiopathy, if you're forming clots, you could think of presence of a lot of von Willebrand factor there that's enhancing this process from happening. So you using N-acetylcysteine and taking that von Willebrand factor out, what would it do? You won't be able to effectively form small clots within your small vessels and therefore N-acetylcysteine, if it can reduce the von Willebrand factor levels, could have some benefit. Again, these are not proven therapies but experimental therapies. So something we could consider to try in our patients if things are not going our way. So this is how you're going to treat your patient with DITMA. Supportive care, supportive care, supportive care. If things are not going your way and you want to trial out some cool experimental drugs, Eculizumab and N-acetylcysteine are the only two choices you have. Last but not least, important thing is always learn from a lesson and therefore if somebody had taken this drug and had a problem, do you want to trial this drug again in these patients? Are you saying absolutely not? Then you're right on the money. Learn from our mistakes and never fall twice. Learn from your mistakes and never make the same mistakes twice. But important point to make even in that regard would be if it is immune mediated, then absolutely not. You cannot take this drug ever again. But if it is non-immune, can you consider reusing this drug? Yes, it is possible because it wasn't an immune mediated destruction, was it? It was a non-immune mediated direct toxicity. So if it is non-immune mediated, the non-immune mediated drugs could possibly be considered to be used again in the future in select cases. Thank you for watching. If you like our content, please subscribe to our channel, like this video and leave a comment below as it helps out the algorithm a lot. And please tell us what other videos you want us to make and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching. If you like our content, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so you get notified when a video is released every week. Have fun studying. We'll see you in the next one.